Before we begin today's program, um, we'd like to start by giving a land acknowledgement. Uh, this acknowledgement was co-created with the Muwekma Ohlone tribe and the Native American Student Development, and it is a living um, document uh, that is co-collaborated. Um, the Native American Student Development recognizes that UC Berkeley sits on the territory of Huchun, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chochenyo speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Muwekma Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona Band. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. Consistent with our values of community, inclusion, and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. As members of the Berkeley community, it's vitally important that we not only recognize the history of the land on which we stand, but also we recognize that the Muwekma Ohlone people are alive and flourishing members of the Berkeley and broader Bay Area communities today. Um, as a part of our land acknowledgement, um, we also would like to invite um, people here and your communities as well to uh, take action. And um, we are posting links uh, so that you can donate to the Karuk relief efforts here. Um, we have a native community um, that has been affected by the fires in California. And um, Royal here who will be presenting today um, is part of this community and we would like to support um, the Karuk tribe and the surrounding areas. So please um, donate if you can, uh, share the links if you can, and um, we will be forever appreciative. Um, I'd like to explain a little bit about virtual engagement for today. First and foremost, we'd like to inform everyone that this event will be recorded and posted on YouTube in a week. If you don't want your information recorded, please keep your video off and your mic muted. We will also be live streaming on the Native American Student Development Facebook account. Second, um, for pronouns, we ask everyone to share their pronouns. If you have not done so already, please add your pronouns to your Zoom name. We say our pronouns so that we don't misgender people. You can do this by using your mouse to hover over your picture Select the three dots at the very top right corner of the screen and select rename. If you have questions about using pronouns, please reach out to us to learn more. Um, we will be holding questions until after the scholars present and we'll be monitoring the chat throughout the event. So please feel free to insert your questions in the chat at any time. Although we won't be answering them until the Q&A portion later on. And in the top right hand corner, you can select speaker view or gallery view. Uh, gallery view is nice because you can see all the participants and to view both speaking in a window. Um, so next I'm going to hand it off to Atea, who is here with us to talk a little bit about the event today, Crossing Paths in History. Yeah, thanks, Roxy. Mike, Nunainia Atea Saspuch. I'm one of the coordinators for the American Indian Graduate Student Association, along with Sierra Ed, who is also uh, here with us. And Crossing Paths brings together undergraduate and graduate Native and Indigenous students to present on their scholarly research or current projects. Community members, staff, faculty, students, and families gather for an hour to hear presentations, present feedback, and engage in discussion. This lecture series began in 2012 under the direction of graduate student Olivia Chilchote and has been continued by subsequent graduate student chairs of the American Indian Graduate Student Association. Crossing Paths is the only event on Berkeley's campus that offers a space for all Native and Indigenous graduate and undergraduate students to engage in exchange and learning. The event is intended to foster community and build professional skills among students and their broader networks. We welcome non-Indigenous folks to the space today, but ask that you please be respectful and help cultivate the Indigenous-centered space we have intended by prioritizing Indigenous voices and experiences. Today's event wouldn't be possible without our sponsors, so we want to say a big thank you to the Native American Student 
Development, as well as the American Indian Graduate Program. I'm gonna hand it back to you, Roxy. Thanks everyone for joining. Yeah, thank you so much, Atea, Atea and others, Louisa and Finosha and many others here have been responsible for helping to put this event on. So thank you so much for your continued work and sharing about its history. Um, next, I wanna introduce our speakers for today. I'm really excited about our speakers today. They're really wonderful people. We have Royal Panasi and Gabriel Trujillo. Um, Royal Panasi is a community member of the Cork Valley Indian Reservation and is in her second year of undergraduate studies majoring in conservation and resource studies through the College of Natural Resources. She is currently creating her area of concentration, which will mainly focus on indigenous water conservation, land stewardship, and tribal food sovereignty. She is also an intern in SPUR, um, a program for undergraduate students, and is currently working on qualitative analyses of native plant specimens, as well as coding interview transcripts of cultural practitioners that are located back home on the Karuk homeland. To her, it is truly special to be able to stay reconnected with the land back home while being in academia. And we also have today Gabriel Trujillo, um, is an, uh, Gabriel is an indigenous uh, Chicanx PhD student in the Department of Integrative Biology. Um, they have been recognized for their superior academic achievement and promise of continuing achievement as both the Chancellor's and Ford Foundation Fellow. Driven by their interest in tropical plant ecology, they joined the Fine Lab in 2019. Other research interests include indigenous language reclamation and pursuing the indigenous revitalization indigenous language revitalization designated emphasis. Um, they are studying factors that influence Cephalanthus occidentalis' recent range expansion into the temperate zone. And they also volunteer as a resident scientist with Bay Area Public Schools as a part of their commitment to share plant science with local communities. Outside of academia, you can find Gabriel dancing, gardening, and growing a lot of native plants. Um, and so um, next we want to open up time to each of our speakers today, both Royal and Gabriel, and we'll be giving them around 10 minutes each um, to share about themselves and their work with us. And um, then after they both speak, we will open it up for Q and A to everyone here. So as you um, listen to today's talks, um, feel free to hold on to your questions or send them in the chat. Um, we have people who will help uh, collect your questions and we'll answer them um, as we can when we get to the Q&A portion. So thanks everybody in uh, Royal, it's, it's all you. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, I'm Yuki, my name is Royal Panasi. I'm a second year student here um, and I am excited to present my research, my current research, I started in September. Um, but yeah, let's get started. Um, so right now I am currently doing botanical research within the Aboriginal territory. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and I just wanted to give a brief research overview specifically about what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, and I wanted to have these main points. Um, so what is the Karuk Agroecosystem Resilience Initiative and what's the goal? What is my role within this initiative and what am I currently researching? And altogether, why is this important, not only within academia, but also back home um, within the Aboriginal territory? So what is the initiative? Um, so the Karuk Agroecosystem Agro Resilience Initiative, which is led by UC Berkeley, as well as my tribe, um, is to enhance the resilience of cultural agroecosystems under variable climatic conditions within the Karuk Aboriginal Territory and also within the Klamath River Basin. So through, with, through integrated research and extension, the aim is to assess the condition of cultural agroecosystems agro and component cultural foods and fibers to understand how land use, land management, and climate variables have resulted in agroecosystem resilience or vulnerabilities. It is also to develop innovative decision-making tools through community-based planning processes that can improve land management decision-making, um, not only at the community levels, but also at the federal, state, and tribal levels. Um, and lastly, it is also to build capacity of the Karuk tribe through workshops and mentorship and research analysis, mapping and visualization techniques to assess and manage for abundant cultural food and fiber resources and overall agroecosystem resilience beyond the grant. So basically this project addresses um, 
the main area prior priorities by analyzing impacts of climate variability on biophysical, social, and institutional components of cultural agroecosystems. It also examines potential adaptations and mitigation strategies that can make cultural food and fiber production more resilient and sustainable. Um, and it also designs policy options or institutional frameworks that improve agroecosystem <laughs> productivity and resilience and mitigate impacts on human, animal, plant, and environmental health and well-being. So the approach and results may serve as a model for other tribes as well, striving to revitalize cultural foods and fibers and enhance food security and achieve agroecological resilience in the face of climate change and climate stressors. Next slide, please. So what is my role within this uh, initiative altogether and what is the current research I'm working on? So if you didn't know, uh, my role as an intern has to do with botanical focus research within the territory and also carry out herbarium specimen administration. But due, the, due to the inaccessibility of being able to be on campus, um, instead of herbarium specimen administration, I am now coding transcripts from interviews my supervisors did with cultural practitioners, elders, and family, friends, and relatives, either from this past summer or, last, or within the last year. Also, when it came to applying for this internship, I knew I wanted to work within this initiative, specifically because it's rooted within me to be close with the environment, especially when it comes to the river and the many plants that we gather and use. Generations upon generations of, ancest of ancestral knowledge is embedded within my family, and it was my chance now within academia to, to uncover it. Um, next slide, please. So now we're going to break down the work, and this is specifically towards the plant review and analysis. Um, so right now at the moment, I am currently working on finding sources and data that are relevant to the current plant that I'm researching. Um, and basically overall, um, I am reviewing botanical related publications and summarizing pertinent information with, with using close reading analysis. Um, I would be doing data in a varying voucher specimen within an Excel spreadsheet, but due to the current conditions in the COVID-19 pandemic, I am not doing that at the moment. Um, next slide, please. Um, so right now, I am currently researching Yerba Buena, and mostly when it comes to the research, the key areas that I'm looking into are ideal growing requirements, that is the slope, aspect, elevation, light, temperature, soils, water, availability, humi humidity, habitat condition, and also the fire adaptation. Um, I am also looking into stressors, so that basically um, has to do with climate, um, disease, pests, and pathogens, um, and also with the examples of management and methods of processing. So this is usually particular for iris and sugar pine, so I won't be discussing it as much during um, this time. Um, and also the predicted response to climate change, as well as the observations of climate change influences on the plant species over time. Next slide. Oh wait, never mind. Can you go back, please? I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, I just really wanted to discuss Yerba Buena itself. Um, it is a perennial herb located within California, as well as other states such as Idaho with this shady chaparral ecosystem. Um, the leaves are wide and ornate and bloom small slot flowers that change from white to lavender um, from May to July. That is the blooming period. And also back home, we use it as tea that is closely related, which is closely related to the mint family. And my family gathers and dries it, but can also, it is also used to treat colds and flus. And it's also just, to, it is also just nice to drink on its own. Um, you can also either use it fresh or dried. And all you have to do is steep a handful of leaves into a Pyrex pot filled of hot water for about 20 minutes. Also a fun fact, it grows behind my dad's fire station, which is located in T-Bar um, within the territory. And he usually gathers it and dries it for me to use when he comes home. <laughs> Next slide, please. So this is transcript coding. And right now at the moment, or I wanted to give an example. Um, and currently I am reading about specific plots and regions that my community uses and tries to, to, to restore and revitalize year after year. Um, within an academic setting and with coding, I am able to preserve and hold on to this knowledge as well as pass it down to the next generation. I specifically wanted to dive into a transcript about paragraphs to give you an example of how I make code or categorize, categorize key paragraphs or phrases spoken by elders and cultural practitioners. To do this work, I follow a qualitative analysis code book that has many relevant topics towards indigenous land use, contemporary and historic non-Indigenous land use, contemporary and historic, and it usually includes the processes of mining, logging, ranching, and agriculture, as well as the impact it has within our forest. 
um, resilience, vulnerability, as well as climate change and climate stressors that have greatly impacted the cultural resources here. Um, bear grass is a plant that has long been used by my people who harvest the leaves for, for basketry and regalia. Um, the changes with the changes and disturbances that occurred um, within the range of bear grass have included fire frequency and severity, plant harvest intensity, as well as land use. These transcripts also document the changes in disturbance patterns and how it might affect bear grass within its environment. Though it may seem that future research needs to include advancing knowledge of the effects of human and natural dis disturbances on the plant and its habitat, my community has already established and maintained a connection with the plant and the land. In reality, Western science is now just beginning to catch up and understand the resources that we have implemented since immemorial, such as cultural fire regimes and land stewardship practices. Next slide, please. Um, prescribed birds are a big management technique that we use to help preserve and care for the native biodiversity, such as bear grass. And I wanted to use this picture specifically. Um, this is Michael Sanchez, who um, works with my dad um, within the Six Rivers National Forest. And he is doing a cultural bear grass burn on the Six, uh, within, on the Six Rivers National Forest back in June 2019. Um, when I was discussing this with my dad, I didn't even notice it at first, but there was a small minor detail that I missed that is super crucial to maintaining um, this knowledge as well as just <laughs> as well as just um, maintaining and, and taking care of this land. Um, as you can see, he is using a propane tank and not drip torch fuel as propane tends to burn cleaner. And as a result, it doesn't leave a petroleum residue on the new shoots. Um, which can be detrimental because weavers use this for plant for baskets and rattles and usually babies put them in their mouths. Um, but yeah, next slide, please. Ooh, that looks weird. Um, why is this research important? Next slide. Living here my whole life has proved not only to be beneficial towards my education, but for my community back home overall, as I know how to restore and maintain my community's traditional land practices, as well as now have this opportunity to bring insight and indigenous perspective towards environmental science. This traditional ecological knowledge passed down to me is vital in keeping our land and practices from dying. Being in academia has also been helpful as I now have been able to understand different software programs, which is crucial in terms of keeping track of native species. I have also had the opportunity to think critically and learn how to analyze important information and data from academic texts that are beneficial for years to come. Throughout my time in undergrad so far, I have been finding my knowledge from home and from academia intertwining and creating something beautiful. Having the time to be enveloped in these practices is now leading me back to the one community who I haven't yet had the time to interact with, and that is the community here at UC Berkeley. Getting to know faculty and discuss with them my experiences about being a Native person is something that many rarely get the chance of doing. This opportunity of working with faculty, graduate students, and colleagues will help everyone within academia become more aware of the oppression we have dealt with since Western civilization has occurred. It is an opportunity collectively for everyone by bridging the gap between traditional ecological knowledge and academic, law, academic knowledge. Conservation heavily impacts my life inside and out the classroom, um, and it's and also, I'm, and also I'm hungry to learn more and teach others about how I live as an, as an Indigenous student who is very close to the environment. With the opportunity that SPUR represented, I was able to advocate and teach others about the way my people live and interact with their surroundings. Having all of this come to fruition is the goal and what drives me every day. Being able to conserve the biodiversity from where I live keeps me rooted, and I want to do that within higher education. You're helping not only me in my career goals, but you're helping my community and the culture of Karuk people. Understanding and knowing all of this is a great opportunity for my community on campus and at home. It will help, <laughs> it will help basically um, cultivate my career goals and help others to learn. It is an entity altogether that brings us all together. That's it, thank you. And oh, next slide. <laughs> Yo, Toa, and if you have any questions or comments, or if you want to contact me, um, it's all listed down below. But yeah, thank you for listening. Um, but yeah, I can open it to questions. Um, yeah, but. well, thank you so much, Royal. That was really fantastic. Um, 
I we're going to save the questions from the audience until the end. Um, but I wanted to ask you one question in the meantime, um, before we move to Gabriel's presentation. And um, I'm wondering, are there any new perspectives on the specific kinds of plants you've been um, that have been part of the research that you're working on? Or are there any new perspectives on the community, your community that um, have formed as a result of the interview coding work that you've done? Um, yes. Um, if you, I would, I would like, can, can we go back to the slides real quick? Is that, is that a possibility? Okay. I think Finosha maybe has the slides yeah. here. Um, if not, Royal, I think you still have sharing abilities as well. Okay, okay, okay. here we go. Um, can you go back to the slide that had the prescribed burn on it, Finosha? Thank you. Um, within this quote that I found, this was actually within a transcript, transcript um, by Kathy McCovey, who was a cultural practitioner and anthropologist apologists back home. Um, when I read this um, at first, I coded it, you know, under climate change and climate stressors as, rel as well as vulnerabilities. And I found it interesting because I discussed it with my advisor. And originally she, um, we usually discuss and talk about the different types of codes and words that we use. And she did not use vulnerabilities. And she then broke down and asked me why. And from a native perspective, um, you know, uh, having fire come and ravage, you know, um, all of the work that we've done and put through and put in, like, put within the forest as well. I was just now gone, um, and she just didn't realize, you know, that that is a vulnerable state. Um, that our community altogether is in. And, you know, I feel like that's a perspective that I brought with to that situation because I feel like if I wasn't there, then she would have not, she wouldn't have caught it. And it just basically would have gone on and it wouldn't, it, would, it just wouldn't have been a thing, you know? Um, so I feel like I bring that perspective to the table, you know, that indigenous perspective um, of just catching things and understanding that, um, Based, just just understanding the cultural resources and how important they are to back home. Yeah, absolutely. That's very important and really wonderful that you're there to provide your perspective on such an important project. Um, thank you so much, Royal, for that really wonderful, wonderful talk about and sharing for some of your work. We're going to move now to Gabriel and um, let you talk a little bit about your research for the next 10 minutes or so. Uh, great. Well, um, welcome everybody once again. I'm just getting this situated. Can everybody see my screen? Cool. Um, yeah, so my, again, my name is Gabriel. Um, I am a second year student in integrated biology um, in the fine lab here at UC Berkeley. And I wanted to talk to you about HALU. Uh, the indigenous and evolutionary of it. And Halu is also known as button bush, or many people in California call it button willow, um, but its uh, Latin name is Cephalanthus occidentalis. And here's a picture of me next to one in button willow, California. Um, it's very large. I'm going to talk about it uh, a little bit more, but this is the, the, the tallest one I've ever seen. Some of them are, are a little bit wider, but they're kind of this like mix between a very big bush and a small tree. Um, but first, before I get into all of that, I kind of wanted to talk about how I got here to be a second year graduate student at UC Berkeley. Um, I had an opportunity to get or to go to Lake Forest College, and I knew I wanted to do science, and I knew uh, I wanted to study plants, but I didn't know exactly sure how I should go about doing that. So um, I went out to my, uh, my department, and I went and looked at all of the professors there and I found all of them that studied plants and I set up a meeting with them in their office hours and asked them about research opportunities. I asked them about what type of science people are doing at the university right now or at the college um, and what kind of opportunities there were for students to do research. And a lot of it was like for older students or students that had been in the program for a little bit longer, but there was a specific um, program geared towards first year students 
And I applied to that and I got in and I got my first research experience. And once you really get your first research experience, or at least it, how it worked for me, I just kind of, it was kind of like a, a rolling, uh, like a, a rolling ball or something like that. I just kept going and going and building on each other. And once I had like one opportunity, so many more doors opened for me. And I really made great mentors with these, these faculty that I went on like the first week of school and my freshman year. And they ended up helping me write my senior thesis and my senior thesis. And I, I got over maybe like six or seven different internship opportunities and tried to do as much science as I could, try to do as much field work as I could. And um, after that, I um, after I finished my undergrad, I didn't wanna go directly to, to um, grad school. So I took some time off. But what I was able to do is to really build my my resume and build my my skills as a, a field leader and um, taking teams out into the into um, into nature out into uh, the field and go collect uh, plants, learn how to identify plants that people have never seen before. And I did a lot of this work with the Great Basin Institute and the Conservation Corps. Um, but it's a great opportunity for people who have never done field research and they want to is to to first go as a as a team member and then potentially uh, come back the following year as a team leader. Um, but because I had so much research experience before this, I, I got hired on as a team leader and uh, learned about organizing, learned about all the logistics it takes to bring people out into the field and have enough food and um, shelter and water and everything so that we could get our work done and go learn about some plants and some ecosystems. But um, I soon learned that this type of work wasn't sustainable. There were like five or six months, potentially eight months of the year I would have this job, but then it's only seasonal. So then I would go and like flip burgers and work at a bar for like my winters and then go back and do it again. And I did this for two years, uh, first in Nevada with the Great Basin Institute. And then secondly, in Southern New Mexico, just studying plants. but this kind of like opened my eyes and made me realize like, well, how can I do this more long term? And how can I be the person running these experiments and leading them versus someone who's working for somebody else? And I can really control who I can bring out into the field with me and give opportunities to, um, to learn about science and to be more acquainted with the land and get out there. And a lot of this stuff is public land that's been like seeds from indigenous people. And it's just really, um, really like isolated from a lot of groups but just being able to get um to for me to get out there from living in in cities in Arizona to like moving to some more rural areas in in um in Michigan to be able to go back to the west and be able to learn about all these plants was really um eye-opening by giving me a lot of opportunity to uh, to go to university and to build my resume so that I could come back to graduate school and study something like cephalanthus um Here's a picture of Cephalanthus occidentalis. Um, this is a, a species that grows um, in the Central Valley of California, but has this really huge range. And I'll show you a picture of that. Uh, I'll show you a picture of that soon. Um, but it grows from um, Guatemala all the way up into uh, Canada and like northern Maine. Um, but some of its common names are buttonwood, lead flower, marsh perfume. Um, it smells really beautifully. Um, but for all the science or it's in the Ruby AC, um, like I said, it grows um, pretty wide, but the tallest ones I've seen are probably about like 30 meters or 30 feet tall or so. And this is, um, this has about 20, 22, 23 feet, um, but it grows in uh, wetlands and it likes both moving and stagnant water. Um, it has opposite leaves and it has a bunch of hairs under the leaves too. And I'll talk a little bit about that if I have time. Um, so like, why did I want to study button bush? Like, why did I try decide to spend six years of my life studying this plant? And it has a lot of really cool scientific reasons, but it also has a lot of, uh, really great uh, personal reasons too, but it all kind of, um, comes around the, this huge range that it has. So here's a picture of its, its known range as of right now from Mexico all the way up into, um, Canada and Northern Maine, but there's some of these like desperate um, populations in central California and in Arizona and then parts of Texas. And it, it just kind of leads me to believe that there's probably different species in this kind of um, complex of, of individuals. But um, what's really great about it is that it 
competes really well above and below uh, this frost line. And for people who don't know, this frost line kind of goes around right about here across the lower part of the United States, if you can see my cursor. And oops. And it grows on both sides of that in both hot and cold environments. And this is another thing that connects me to Royals um, research is because we study stressors. And one thing that this plant does really well is that it can overcome stressors like cold and drought and live in a lot of really amazing places. Um, but my question is like, how is it able to do that? Because there's not many plants that can do that. And um, this one specifically has a, a history of living in the tropics and moving north into these colder areas. And in North America, I believe there's only 23 species of tree or woody plants that have been able to make this leap from the temperate or from the tropical zones into this temperate area. So this plant is really, really special that it can, it, it can not only move into these cold areas, but it can still have strong competing populations in um, Central America as well. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about my personal reasons for choosing this plant to study. Um, well, part of it is a little bit selfish because I wanted to use this, this species to, to be able to travel and a lot of people do that. But uh, what, I really, uh, what I'm really happy about the species is that it grows in a lot of the areas that my family lives in. My family lives in Arizona um, and I have a lot of ties to, to Mexico as well. But being able to study this plant and have the opportunity to travel through Mexico and get a, reacquainted with some of these ancestral lands um, to a lot of my families and a lot of my family is very Catholic and the Catholics uh, arrived into Mexico and brought a lot of indigenous people into the Southwest and have settled there. And that's where a lot of my family lives now. Um, but being able to use the species to reconnect with these native lands of Mexico um, is a really great opportunity for me to to get this amazing education and to be able to study this plant um, and has really um, directed me to being able to, to make these connections as well. But um, because of COVID, I, I haven't been able to do everything that I would like to, but I would like at once uh, I'm able is to work with indigenous communities around um, or like within these groups and take people out to or take indigenous communities out to the field and be able to see this plant and teach them my science. And, and ideally it'd be really nice to have an exchange where I could learn about their indigenous names for the plant um, and have this, this kind of reciprocal mutual um, learning opportunity where I can give what I can and hopefully receive what other people are willing to share with me. Um, but like I said, I'm really interested in these stressors and the biggest stressor that I've seen is frost and um, cold temperatures. And so here's some examples of Cephalanthus growing in the snow and it has a lot of different, um, and a lot of different shapes. Um, but this one, it kind of has like one trunk here and then lots of stems that come out of it. And then um, in the picture on the left, you can see these are the fruit and it's called button bush because of these, these parts, these frozen fruit. Um, they're hard, almost like wood, and you can cut them and drill holes into them um, if you cut, if you um, dry them out at the right time to make buttons. So that's kind of um, why it has this name button bush. Um, but another stressor is drought and it grows, this plant grows in the middle of the desert, middle of the Sonoran Desert in Arizona, um, alongside wetlands, alongside this river here. It's really beautiful to be able to jump into uh, kayaks and go collect. But other times it's just um, this drier area. Um, also, I can't see my time, how long I've been talking. So if, if I'm getting close, just please jump in and say something. I think you got about um, another uh, five minutes or so, maybe a couple less, but go for it. All right. Um, but one thing I wanted to learn uh, along this journey to studying this plant in, um, and how it's kind of grown through these different environments is to learn more about the indigenous significance of it. And um, what I, I went to a Button Willow, California, and I found this historical landmark and it got me thinking a lot. But it says here, a lone tree landmark on an odd Trans Valley Trail. It was an ancient Yoku uh, Indian meeting place, later, um, later location for white stock radio or rodeos. Uh, Miller and Lux established their headquarters and store here about 1850 or 1885 in the town of Button Willow and takes the name from the old tree and the rodeo grounds. 
Um, so it's just kind of this historical marker of this indigenous uh, landmark where people used to come. Um, and basically this area is super flat in the Central Valley of California. And this, this tree, these, these, uh, these bushes kind of stood out as a place to meet. And you can see it from, from pretty far. Um, so one thing I did want to share, I know I don't have a whole lot of time, but I wanted to share about something that I have found and it's, it's, it's language and its uses in many different, um, for many different groups around the United States and in Mexico. Um, and just to share some of the indigenous names and uh, uses here. Um, one thing that was really valuable to me was a, um, a Florida ethno, uh, ethnobotany book that had a few pages about Cephalanthus and went through a bunch of the names um, that are found here. And this is the Austin 2004 um, source that I have there. Um, but just to, um, to keep going, um, I, I have a ton of questions like, why is this range so big? Um, how do the populations differ? What makes them more capable of living in, in cold weather versus hot weather? Um, do they just have a really easy way to survive both? That's not very cost effective. Um, but yeah, a lot of different opportunities to study this plant. Um, some, some hypotheses is that it's recently dispersed into this temperate zone, um, that it's a different species genetically. It has a low cost to frost tolerance. So it's really able to survive in these cold areas without a whole lot of expenditure of energy. Um, but it could potentially be that it, it's just, um, good at defending herbivores and it doesn't really put a lot of uh, time into frost tolerance. So there's a lot of different factors that could influence the way that they have spread throughout um, their current range. Um, so I guess one thing that, uh, one historical hypothesis that tropical plants um, have is that they, um, they have a trade-off between competition and, um, and cold tolerance and that if, they, if they invest energy into being tolerant to cold temperatures, then they won't be able to use that same energy to grow tall. And there's this kind of trade off between those two things. Um, but I think that it's more complicated than just being able to grow tall. There's other forms of competition, like being able to fend off herbivores or fend off fungal pathogens, um, instead of just growing tall or being able to survive um, in complex communities. Um, so I know I'm getting close to my time, but, um, I have three parts to my, um, to my project for my thesis. Um, and this is a phylogenetic or phylogeographic study. And this is just basically collecting a bunch of plant material from many different, as many different individuals as I can, and then looking at their genes and their DNA to see how closely related they are to one another. Um, and then once I figure that out, I'll be able to understand, um, where they have divided and then look at those specific individuals to um, build a common garden study where I would take plants from all over their range and then plant them in one single common garden and look at how they relate to one another and do some cool exclusion studies where I cover up some plants and leave some open and see how they fend themselves off to natural herbivores. Um, but like I said, this field work is really cool and I get to be in wetlands and then um, take kayaks out onto the water and find these really amazing plants. Um, there's a lot more I could talk about now, but I just want to show you some of these pictures of, um, of how they grow. They're from the woody area. They'll, they'll put out these green stalks and have flowers at the end. Um, Here's, an, here's a place in uh, Tucson where uh, the rivers have dried out completely and they're able to still survive. But in other areas, they're only, they're exclusively in oblig ob obligated to live um, near water opening. So, um, so yeah, some future directions is looking at a different species that lives in Mexico. And then potentially, like I was saying earlier about um, how they grow a lot of hairs underneath their leaves. This is a, a really close up picture of um, some veins on the bottom of a leaf and how they house um, they house eggs for mites and potentially have a, um, a relationship there. Um, and another thing I could look at in the future, but, um, with that said, I wanted to say thank you to everybody for coming and listening, and I'm excited to take some questions. Gabriel, thank you so much for sharing about yourself and about your work with all of us. Um, it's really interesting, the work that you do and, um, 
Uh, we're about to open um, the event up to questions from everybody, but first I wanted to ask a little bit um, about how your journey to graduate school and how your current research has maybe affected your indigenous identity or your journey to understanding that, you know, and getting closer to that. Um, I kind of, I feel like I touched about this a little bit, um, but um, I think that it's helping me rekindle a lot of this kind of indigenous identity by be, being able to make this connection to the land and being able to spend time uh, along these rivers and with these plants and get more acquainted with with the environment. And it's not just like one specific area, it's a lot of the United States. And by no means do I think that my, my ancestors have lived in all of these places, but um, I think that just being able to, to travel through these areas and these lands is, is super valuable. And who's to say that they didn't travel to these areas or trade or you know things like that. So being able to um, walk these similar steps of, um, of, of indigenous people throughout the United States um, and Mexico is a, a great opportunity for me to reconnect and um, kind of understand more of my history along the way. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I think that that's an important step for a lot of us in finding uh, connections to our history. Um, now, um, if everyone has, if any of you have questions, uh, now is the time we're gonna open it up for Q and A. Um, please feel free to use the raise hand function um, or send your questions in the chat. Um, so you can either ask the question, and we can unmute you and you can ask the question yourself or you can type them out if you prefer that. Um, to raise your hand, click on the participants button at the bottom of your Zoom window and you'll see a variety of actions available. And then you click the raise hand button and we will be able to call on you and give you an opportunity to speak. Um, uh, to start off the discussion though, I thought I'd ask, pose a question to both of you. Um, and I kind of wanted to start off broad and I know that some of you, that both of you have touched on this a little bit in both of your talks, but I really wanted to ask, you know, why study plants? Um, what does it mean to do this work from an indigenous perspective for each of you? And the question is posed to both of you. Mara, do you want to go first? I mean, I don't mind. <laughs> Why study plants? I mean, for me, I intended to study plants all along, um, mainly with the goal of coming back home and focusing on community and basically just understanding the medicinal properties um, with the ethnobotany as well as just with the plants um, that are founded back home, as well as just retaining and passing that knowledge down from elders. Um, that was kind of what I wanted to do in, like, in the beginning and a lot of people back home, community members, family, friends, relatives, even teachers knew I had the idea and they kind of pushed me to do that. And it was a wonderful opportunity. I was grateful for so much support. Um, so I feel like that kind of drove me to study plants specifically um, and just pretty much come, come back to my community and teach others to study plants or you know gain the knowledge as well. That's a great answer, Royal. Um, I think that uh, why I started studying plants was, uh, I think I've just, I've been growing them for a long time. I've been working in gardens and had this like strong connection with them and they like, they help grow and it's just a real healing process to be able to, to work with them. I've studied a lot of different things. I've studied a lot of insects and some like fungi some things like that, but I just, I, I found myself just being more drawn to plants for whatever reason and just wanting to, to can you continue to do that. Um, I think that there's a lot, a lot of knowledge that are held in, within these, um, within the plants and um, you just have to be able to listen to them to kind of, to bring it out. And I think that's why it's so important for me to, to spend in the field. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you both for answering that. Um, you'll have to forgive me. I got kicked off of uh, this, so I can't see if anyone has asked questions in the chat. So, Fenosha, Lisa, Retea, if um, anyone raised their hands while I was gone, um, please let me know. Otherwise, I can move on to another question for um, both Royal and Gabriel. 
We haven't had any questions, so go ahead, Roxy. Okay, thank you, Taya. And um, again, if anyone wants to ask these two wonderful people anything, please feel free. Um, I wanted to ask you both, what have your experiences been like doing these um, kinds of research projects? Um, as an Indigenous person, have you can you share some of your experiences or things that you've learned from the work that you're doing? Yeah, so um, I mean, there's there's some good things in there. I mean, there's also some bad things. It's when I was working in Nevada doing uh, vegetation surveys, like I was in an area that was like 70% Trump supporters and like they did, they looked at me funny and was, you know, like talked to me differently and just had difficulty always coming into contact with anybody from the public being on public land. And they're the, even not only just the, like being like the public could be always a scary incident. There's people that have, um, that have guns out in these areas and that's always just kind of like a, an intense thought, but just um, being able to um, to be out there and to talk to some of the the people that run with the that like uh, that manage the land, working with um, land managers with the BLM and some of these other um, parks. Sometimes they don't want us there either because they have this like dual um, dual um, mission or like multi use mission to. Um, to extract minerals and things from the land. So when you have scientists or people coming out there identifying the plants and digging up the soil and um, that kind of stuff, they everybody gets kind of on edge and uh, they don't really want you there because they're going to think that you're, for some reason, the scientific research is going to keep them from, from making money off of the land and exploiting it. But I think that's just part of, that's part of the change that needs to happen is that more people need to go out there and to go and um, to do these things so that um, so that people can manage the land better. But um, that's a lot of, I feel like a lot of negative things. I think there's a lot of positive things that have come out of my research as well. And being able to have opportunity to, um, to be a, to be a representation or to be able to represent indigenous people and to 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 show that to show younger people and kids that like hey he's a scientist he's getting his doctorate he or he's going to be a doctor um i think is great to be able to inspire youth and to let them know that they can do these things too and it's not out of their their reach so talking to kids and teaching them about science has always been a really great um a really great um experience for me Thank you, Gabriel. Um, Royal, would you like to add anything or we have some other questions uh, for you yeah. here in the chat? Um, I would say my experience so far, I mean, I've just started doing research, but I'm hoping to, you know, further um, my projects as well as just further my like knowledge and experiences throughout, you know, my undergrad and hopefully grad school. But so far I've had a great time, you know, learning the different software programs that I've never used before, um, specifically for this research. Um, we use NVivo, which is the coding um, software for transcripts, and I've never used that. And it was something so interesting and just like useful. Um, but I would also say um, before research, I did some workshops back home, um, I think two years ago, and that was with culture practitioners, family, friends, as well as grad students and undergrad students from different schools such as Humboldt State, Stanford, um, Davis, and UC Berkeley. And just as well as like tilt, like kids as well. And it was just, just a fun learning experience because they got to learn from me in terms of eating and um, cooking like traditional foods. Um, and it's just a fun like learning process for everyone because all the questions they had were just wonderful and they just wanted to learn more and gain like more insight on how we live as people. Um, so I would say like that's kind of what I've been doing so far. Thank you. That's a fantastic answer. Um, we have a couple of questions for uh, specifically for you, Royal. Um, the first one is, do you use propane to light all cultural burns? or just in areas with certain plants, like the basket and rattle materials you mentioned? Originally, I didn't even know we used propane until my dad told me. Um, 
Usually we use drip torch fuel, which is a mixture of diesel fuel and gasoline, and that helps carry the flame from the drip torch to the ground. And then diesel fuel provides like a longer residual burn time altogether just for the prescribed burning. Um, and they use that at cultural sites as well as just, you know, clearing brush um, back home. Um, but yeah, that's a great question because I'll have to ask like my dad or other, um, you know, relatives that I know as to why he used propane because it was really interesting when he told me because I've never heard of anyone using propane until he told me it was a cleaner fuel to use um, just in case, you know, um, basket weavers went and gathered and used those plants for their, you know, baskets and rattles and other things. Yeah, absolutely. And um, actually building off of some of that knowledge you just shared, we had another question for you. Um, the question, well, it says, so awesome that your dad works at the fire department and can use indigenous fire management practices. Do you know if these practices are being shared or solicited or implemented by other fire departments? So my dad specifically works for, he's a fire technician for the Forest Service. His station is located in T-Bar. Um, main, I know, I'm not too sure about that. I know that the Western Klamath Restoration Project does a lot of prescribed burning, and I'm sure that they work closely with um, the Forest Service within the Six Rivers National Forest. Um, there's also the Mid-Klamath Watershed Council. Um, just as also the Department of Natural Resources that all use prescribed burning and management practices. But I'm not sure about any other fire or like forest stations or even CAL FIRE using prescribed burning um, at this moment. Great, thank you. Um, we have some questions about IRB, the Internet, the review board, uh, some technical questions I think that are being answered in the chat. Um, I don't want anyone to uh, miss out on their questions being asked, but it looks like it's being um, taken care of. Uh, we do have one more question here for Gabriel, um, and then uh, we'll probably be wrapping up after that. So the question is, what is the most difficult part about field work, getting the funding, preparing for logistics, or the work itself? Um, I guess, um, let me think about it for a second. There, there's like a lot of things that are, that can be difficult. I think the most, the, the, the thing that I had the most difficult with was like relying on the weather. Like you can be as fully prepared as you need to be to go out to the field and do the work you need. But sometimes other things that aren't necessarily planned keep you from being able to do that. And sometimes it's the weather. Sometimes you get stung by like paper wasps and you can't work for the rest of the day. Sometimes it's like, I don't know all sorts of things. Sometimes you just need like a hamburger or like, uh, like, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't need a whole lot of meat. So like a veggie burger, I'm sorry. But sometimes you just like need things like that to, um, I don't know, to, to keep you going. But a lot of the times the, the logistics is kind of boring and being on the computer to like get everything ready to get out there. But the, the most difficult thing I think to deal with is like when you're ready and prepared and you're like, you get everybody else on your team ready to go. And then you can't because of some other outside, um, like a, some outside force that's like preventing you, whether it's, you know, the weather or something along those lines. But um, yeah, I think that's probably, <laughs> that's probably my answer. <laughs> well, thank you, Gabriel and Royal. I think that, you know, historically, um, indigenous knowledge, traditional knowledge and academia or STEM or the sciences, what have you, have been considered separate bodies of knowledge. And I think that's in large part because of the people who've been in the academy and doing the science in the past. And it's really wonderful and lovely to see both of you here bridging that gap with your work. And um, I'm really excited to see what comes from all of um, your work in the future. I think one of the questions I would have asked if uh, we didn't run out of time was, where do you see your future going? But I guess we'll just have to watch to find out. <laughs> so um, I just wanna thank everybody for attending. Thank you so much. Um, uh, please, um, we are going to, we just posted the link in the chat. If you are able to donate or to share um, to uh, the Karuk tribes affected by fires, in California, please do. If you have any interest in presenting at Crossing Paths in the future, Atea also put that link in the chat. And um, and thank you everybody again for attending. Thank you Royal and Gabriel for your wonderful work and everyone who put on this event for all their hard work as well. Um, I look forward to seeing you all at future Crossing Paths.
Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Tazo Komati. Yeah. If this were the room, I think everybody would have a large round of applause clap. So I'll just do it for us here. <laughs> Zoom is weird and <laughs> we don't have that. So. Yay. Yay. Thank you. Thank you.